You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme, could you pay more for things which harm the environment? We hear the view from Westminster on whether a carbon tax might be on the way. With temperature records in North America and Canada broken numerous times this week, is climate change making the Pacific Northwest heat wave worse? And the tension between protecting nature and promoting economic prosperity in Uganda. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those developing the solutions. Now, running a petrol or diesel car or even using gas in your home could be set to become more expensive. It's been reported that the government is considering introducing a carbon reduction scheme which would see the cost of climate damaging activities increase. The aim will be to persuade people to switch to greener alternatives, helping the UK meet its target to reach net zero emissions by 2050. Our political correspondent Tamara Cohen has the details from Westminster. It's being reported in The Times that families are looking at paying an extra £170 on their annual gas bills and an extra £100 for the average car user as a result of these policies to cut emissions. Now, I understand these are the sort of figures that people in government are looking at, but it's stressed to me that no decisions have been made and the government will be consulting on all this later in the year. It's all part of a system called emissions trading, which the government is looking at extending to buildings and transport. This is a scheme under which sectors that produce a lot of emissions are charged more. The problem is they pass on some of those costs to consumers. Now, while ministers always say that they want to make their climate policies as affordable as possible, they've been told off by their own climate advisers because they haven't really set out any firm policies for how they get to the target of net zero emissions. And that may well be because if it means higher bills in the short term, that's always going to be a tough sell. To North America now, where this week has seen record-breaking heat in both the US and Canada. The Pacific Northwest is a region normally known for its cool, rainy weather with the occasional hot and sunny day mixed in. But in recent days, it's been a very different story. Portland in Oregon reached almost 47 degrees on Monday. The average temperature for this time of year would normally see highs of around 26 degrees. In Washington state, Chelan County near Seattle reached 48 degrees on Tuesday. While in Canada, Lytton in British Columbia broke the country's record for the hottest temperature three days in a row, reaching 49.6 degrees Celsius. Before Sunday, temperatures in the country had never passed 45 degrees. And it's all because of an extreme weather event called a heat dome. It's caused by the atmosphere trapping and heating air while compressing it down like a lid on a saucepan. Meteorologists say the phenomenon has been worsened by human-caused climate change, making extreme weather events more common. Well, let's bring in Dr Heidi Stelzer, a climate scientist at the Department of Environment and Sustainability at Port Fort Lewis College in Colorado. Welcome to you. What's your view? Is it possible to attribute this heat wave to climate change? It's a weather event. It's a weather event that's taking place uh, and bringing our consciousness towards concern for climate change. And I think that's different than saying that we can attribute this to climate change. So it brings our attention forward to something that's part of a weather system we don't want to see more of uh, because it it sets an imbalance um, relative to the systems we have in place for infrastructure, for human habitation of the Northwest and the Southwestern US. And we've heard a lot about this phrase, heat dome. Tell us a little bit more about what that means. So the heat dome was centered here over Southwest US to the one that was in early June. Uh, and we had really hot times, not as hot as the Northwest is now seeing, and dry times. And as the new heat wave has uh, formed, the heat dome has formed in the Northwest, we've actually had really good rain here in the Southwestern part of the US, at least in my region, uh, with um, almost record setting wildflowers um, because um, it was hot and now it's wet. Um, so, so there's, you know, pros, there's, there's balance in the system. And what do you predict might happen in the years ahead? Is it possible that heat waves like this will become more frequent? 
We know that climate change increases the likelihood of extreme climate events. And uh, uh, so the likelihood of an extreme event and a, an extreme event being more extreme. But what is forecast for the few uh, the years ahead? That's really up to us. That's up to each of us for decisions we make uh, and where and how we contribute to uh, a more caring and um, coordinated effort to understand what choices we can make that would minimize the risk um, of more extreme events. Dr. Heidi Stelzer, thanks very much indeed. Let's take a look now at the day's other climate news. And the president of the Seychelles has told Sky News that richer developed nations should help countries on the front line of climate change. He spoke to our correspondent Adam Parsons about witnessing the reality of the climate crisis. I'm looking at the reality of things. And this is why I want to portray myself as this island boy who grew up looking at the stars, enjoying the stars, and who suddenly fear that I might not see the stars again. We're not responsible for that because our emission is next to zero. But the, the, developing, the developed countries, the industrialized countries are responsible. So there needs to be this new working arrangement whereby those who have caused the damage, just like in everyday life, you pay compensation where, where you cause the damage. The number of climate change cases being brought to court has more than doubled since 2015. That's according to analysis by the Grantham Institute, which found that over a thousand litigation cases have been filed in the past six years. The number of strategic cases which aim for wider action has increased, with many targeting government inaction or lack of ambition in reaching climate goals. And a paper has called on scientists to find potential solutions to the challenge of plastic waste. It's currently cheaper to create new plastic than recycle it, so developing more efficient ways of using plastic as well as upcycling products after use are a vital step to finding a solution. One scientist described throwaway culture as the biggest hurdle to overcome. Uganda has one of the most ambitious environmental laws in the whole of Africa and was the first nation in the continent to formally recognise the rights of nature in a similar way to those of humans. But there's a tension for the developing nation between protecting the environment and improving people's lives through economic development. More than half of Ugandans live in poverty and nearly a third are unemployed. So the discovery of huge oil deposits offered a chance to transform the country's fortunes. In April, the Ugandan and Tanzanian governments signed final agreements with the French oil company Total and the China National Offshore Oil Corporation to extract around 1.7 billion barrels of oil from underneath the northern section of the Albertine Rift, an area of extraordinary biodiversity around Lake Albert. Now, this huge area of mountains, valleys and wetlands makes up just over 1% of Africa's land mass, but is home to more than half its birds, 40% of mammals and around 500 species of plants and animals that aren't found anywhere else. Now, once developed, oil from the project will be pumped 900 miles to Tanga, a port on the Tanzanian coast itself surrounded by mangroves and coral reefs. Well, Jack Losh is a journalist who recently visited the site, and I spoke to him earlier and asked about the biodiversity this project might put at risk. This new mega oil project is located not only in one of the most biodiverse areas of the African continent, but also on the planet. It's in the Albertine Risk, uh, Rift, which is a huge colossal network of mountains, uh, forests, lakes and grasslands that stretches across multiple countries. The French oil firm Total and a massive Chinese oil corporation are making the final moves to begin extracting 1.7 billion barrels worth of crude from there. And yet Uganda does have a new and ambitious environmental law which basically recognises the rights of nature in the same way as human rights. So the fact that it's approved these oil projects appears incompatible at least. It's extraordinary that this law came through around the same time that the government was pressing ahead with this oil project. The big question is, 
will this new rights of nature rights of nature law stop the old project? Uh, almost certainly not. Well, joining me now from Kampala for more on this is Dennis Tabaro, Executive Director of the African Institute for Culture and Ecology. Welcome to you. I understand that you've been working with indigenous elders in the area. What role do you think that these communities can play in shaping environmental protections? The indigenous communities who have been living uh, in this uh, land for uh, so many years and uh, they have... Uh, uh, been living uh, and practicing uh, the uh, customary laws, uh, which have been uh, uh, used for uh, protection of their uh, ancestral lands and uh, and, and uh, uh, cultural heritage, and uh, they are uh, uh, attuned to uh, the laws of nature and they respect the laws of nature, which are embedded in their customary laws. Well, as you say, these people have been preserving the land for generations, haven't they? Do you think they have lessons for the rest of the world in terms of protecting the environment? Yes, uh, they, they uh, provide lessons because uh, their customary laws are, are part and parcel of uh, the natural laws, uh, the, the laws of nature, and they live in that part of, of uh, in, in those laws. They don't go to school to learn uh, about uh, about the environment. They don't go to school to learn about nature. The nat natural laws are part and parcel of of their lives. And for them, their land and their ancestral laws are sacred. And everything that is there in nature is sacred. And they follow the laws of nature. Dennis Tabaro, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. That's everything from us for this week, but don't forget to check out our digital show over the weekend. And in the latest episode, we go behind the scenes of Adam Parsons' report into the German coal mine demolishing entire villages. That's available on Sky News social channels, our app and our website. And on Climatecast this week, we hear more from Bangladesh and the challenges and highlights of filming in a country on the front line of the climate emergency. You can find that wherever you normally get your podcasts from. Thanks for watching. See you next week.